Anyway, if you are a visitor here this morning, uh, and we haven't yet met, my name is Ian, I am one of the elders here, and I'm really glad that you're here, and I'd love for you to stick around at the end and have one of those hot cross buns that I can't eat. You will be helping me out if you have one of those, so uh, please do that. Now, today is a day that is celebrated and remembered by millions of Christians across the world. It's also acknowledged by many others and, I believe, often completely misunderstood by many. There are many events throughout history that have changed the world and that we remember. Um, For instance, the First and Second World Wars were fairly big events that changed the world. Many people seeking peace afterwards. Millions of people grateful for the basics that were available, that weren't available during wartime. Some of you will be old enough to remember rationing. Many of you won't know what I'm talking about. But from January 1940, the British government introduced this system that enabled a fair share of all the food. You had to have coupons and things like that. I don't remember that, by the way, just in case you're wondering. You're very rude, some of you who are thinking that. Um, This lasted till the 1950s. In fact, it finished 1954 when meat was the last item to come off of rationing. There were huge amounts of deaths throughout the World Wars. It's hard to say with certainty how many people died during World War II. The estimates are around between, this is quite a big gap, 50 to 80 million people died during the Second World War. There were some positive outcomes. There was the creation of new products, advances in medicine. There was the creation of new fields of scientific exploration. Now, if we think a little further back, does anyone know of an inventor called Johannes Gutenberg? Anyone know what he invented? Not Bluetooth. (laughs) Very good. Anyone else got a good answer? Uh, And I would like to say uh, the right answer, not a funny one, like Dave Gann. Anyone know what Gutenberg invented? The printing press. Now, I don't think there's anyone here that remembers that, because that was in 1440. Who knows what the first thing was that they printed commercially? The Bible. You are a well-informed, educated bunch. I have my doubts, but you are. What about another guy who invented something which changed the world? Tim Berners-Lee. Who knows what he invented? The internet. See, you are a clever bunch. That was a pretty big time, wasn't it? The internet. Who remembers life before the internet? Who thinks it was a much simpler time? (laughs) 1989. That was when that happened. Even more recently... There are things like the pandemic. Life has changed a reasonable amount since then, I'm sure you would agree. People were very affected by it, and even still today, with you know, the rising anxiety and um, fear and uh, education was really affected during that time. But these are well-known, verifiable events in history. We learn about them in school. We love to watch documentaries about them. What, what about events in our own lives? What about things that have changed us, shape our existence? Well, there are three big things, birth, marriages, and deaths. They're pretty big, aren't they? They can affect our lives quite a lot. The day I started dating my wife, there was a cosmic shift in my world. 22 years ago, we started dating, and life has never been the same again. (laughs) The birth of our children... That changes things. Times we have decided to move. Location. They were pretty big, life-changing events in our life. Of course, sadly, I, I remember the highs and lows of being a football fan. I'm sure you all remember 1987, Pat Vanden Howe scores the winning goal, so Everton win the league for the last time ever. The highs of 1987, I'm still living off the good of that, but struggling to be honest. And the lows of England losing in the 1990 World Cup semi-final on penalties. To be fair, that didn't affect the whole of my life, just lowered my expectations. 
But there is nothing more world-changing than what we are celebrating today. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The man who claimed to be the Son of God, equal with the Father, who lived the perfect life. He perfectly fulfilled the law. He never sinned. He upset the religious establishment so much that they wanted to kill him. He spoke what some would say are the greatest words ever spoken. He loved the unlovable. He gave hope to the hopeless. He gave sight to the blind. Hearing to the deaf, he healed the sick and he cleansed the lepers. This incredible man, Jesus Christ, has affected billions of lives for thousands of years. He was put to death on a Roman cross. The religious leaders were so desperate to get rid of him, they called down curses on themselves to see this man die. Then, as we know, three days later, the event that changed the world forever and the destiny of the human race is what we're celebrating today. We're going to read the story and we're going to try and understand why we can believe this, why we can trust this and verify it too. Let's remember, before we read the story, let's try and put ourselves in the scene for a moment. The disciples and followers of Jesus had been with him for three years. <clears throat> They'd seen him do amazing things. Walk on water, raise dead people to life. And then they see their master arrested where he was beaten, whipped, spat upon, nailed to a cross, and they watched him die. Then he was taken down from the cross, put in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. The Bible calls them the secret followers. Where they laid him in a tomb and a stone was rolled across the entrance, sealed and guarded by Roman soldiers. And then, three days later, the women, followers of Jesus, going to the tomb where they wanted to anoint the body. So we're going to read from the Bible, the Gospel of Luke, from chapter 24. It says, but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone had rolled, rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bound their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified, and on the third day, rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all of these things to the eleven and to all the rest. When we read the Gospels, we know that Jesus had previously told them and predicted his death and indeed his resurrection. The disciples at the time would not have fully understood Jesus. They would also would have needed some convincing when he had actually risen. In the Gospel of John, Mary Magdalene saw the empty tomb and went back to tell Simon, Peter and John. And in the Gospel of John, I love how John words this, by the way. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. This is John referring to himself. This is John saying, the one that Jesus loved, had I mentioned that, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple, John, started for the tomb. Both were running. This is a very important thing, detail John felt needed to go in the gospel. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I can imagine if this was me and Jeeves, I definitely would have put that detail in. <laughs> I can imagine a similar, similar sort of relationship between Peter and John. I sometimes wonder if like, when Peter got to glory, he starts reading John's gospel. He's like, oh, this is good, John. There's some strange wording in here, but this is good. And then he gets to the end. He's like, uh... John, John, what, why, why, have you, why did you need to put that in? 
Anyway, so John gets there. So Peter and the, they decide he was outrun, and then John gets there. He says he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along from behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, did I mention who had reached the tomb first, (laughs) also went inside, he saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to where they were staying. I love that detail. John, did I mention it? Just in case you didn't get it, I'm going to mention it twice. I outran Peter. I got there first. And we know that later on in the Gospels, Jesus appears to his disciples. He appeared to more than 500 people that could attest to his resurrection. He appeared to the disciples, to Thomas, who said, unless I see his wounds and touch them, I won't believe. And he saw Jesus, and he believed. After this, we see the ascension, when Jesus goes up to heaven and the Christian faith explode across the world following Pentecost, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on all believers. They were at first called followers of the way. Even today, this story of the resurrection is affecting and changing lives. People still meet today with the person of Jesus, who put their trust in him and follow him and have the reassurance of eternal life. They have a peace that surpasses all understanding. They have a hope that goes beyond this life, a hope that knows, a hope that knows that one day there will be no more suffering, that one day Jesus will make all things new. Now, you might say, it's all very well you saying this, Ian, but isn't the Bible just a book written thousands of years ago that's been changed hundreds of times? Well, the amazing thing is that we celebrate today is that it is true. And we know that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is true and verifiable. The stone was rolled away, not so Jesus could get out. So the disciples could get in. They could see, and so can we today. There is faith required, but it is a trust that can be verified. The resurrection actually took place in time, space, and history. History, you could say, is on our side. Christianity can be investigated and testified and stand up to rigorous investigation. That's what Alpha is all about. You can come and ask those tough questions. Struggle to trust the authenticity of the Bible? Well, we're going to watch a video that's just going to help us understand that. Textual criticism examines the number of copies of early texts that we have available to us today. And it looks at the time gap between the original document and the earliest copy that we have. And basically, the more manuscripts we have and the earlier they are, the less doubt there's going to be about the original. So let's compare the Bible to other texts in ancient history, ones that are widely used in schools and universities. Let's look at the Greek historians Herodotus and Thucydides. They both wrote in the 5th century BC. But the earliest copy of their writings that we have dates from AD 900, and that makes a 1,300-year time lapse. And even then, we only have eight copies of these manuscripts in the first place. Or look at the Roman historian Tacitus. There's a thousand year gap between his book being written and our first manuscript, and we only have 20 copies. Or another classic, Caesar's Gallic War. 950 years between the book being written and our first manuscript copy. And even then, we only have nine or 10 copies of these manuscripts. Again, with Livy's famous History of Rome, a 900-year gap between the book being written and our first manuscript, and we only have 20 copies of this. But when it comes to the New Testament, well, it's very different. The New Testament was written between about 40 and 100 AD, and we have manuscript evidence going back as early as 130 AD, and full manuscripts by 350 AD. And we have more than 5,300 Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin translations, and 9,300 others. 
So, you know, we can be pretty confident in the accuracy, the authenticity, and the integrity of the New Testament scriptures that have been passed down to us today. The remarkable thing about the Bible is there's such a short chronological distance between the events being described and our first manuscripts. So in many ways, the Bible scholars are in a very fortunate position of being able to check these things out and finding that they are much more reliable than, for example, some of the alternatives you're looking at. And as a scholar, I am more than happy to say, I trust this, I take it very, very seriously, I rely on it. Professor F.J.A. Hort, one of the greatest scholars in the area of textual criticism, concluded that, in the variety and fullness of the evidence on which it rests, the text of the New Testament stands absolutely and unapproachably alone amongst ancient prose writings. So I hope that was uh, helpful, I hope you understood that. But for many years, people have been trying to disprove Christianity. In the 18th century, there was a man named Gilbert West, and he didn't like the fact that lots of his friends were becoming Christians. So he decided to write a book to disprove the resurrection. And halfway through writing the book, guess what happened? He met with Jesus and discovered it was true. This was written about them several years ago. In the 1740s, while studying at Oxford, English poet. Gilbert West and the Baron George Littleton set out together to disprove two major events in Christian history, Saul's conversion and the resurrection. After a year of painstaking research, each eventually concluded that Saul was genuinely converted and Jesus genuinely rose from the dead and they became Christians. Oh, but you might say, that was Gilbert years ago. In the 19th century, in America, there was a guy called Ingersoll. He was a famous atheist. He didn't like the fact that Christianity was growing. He had a friend, a famous general called Lew Wallace. He said to his friend, we need to do some damage to Christianity and to the church. We need to write a book to disprove the resurrection. So, Lew Wallace started to write the book. All the while, his wife, who was a Christian, was praying. And by chapter 4, Lou Wallace met with Jesus. And he wrote the book the other way around. And he wrote a book called, anyone know what Lewis Wallace wrote? Ben-Hur. In the 20th century, there was a lawyer and journalist called Frank Morrison. He wanted to destroy the belief of the resurrection. He knew as a journalist how to research. And he was also a lawyer, knew how to understand what the evidence was. In his research, he managed to amass so much evidence for the resurrection, he met with Jesus and wrote his book, Who Moved the Stone? The same thing happened to Lee Strobel. His wife became a Christian. He thought she'd joined a cult, so he wanted to disprove it. He wanted to know, is there credible evidence that Jesus of Nazareth was really the Son of God? Lee Strobel was a, a, a legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. He cross-examined dozens of experts with doctorates from schools like Cambridge and Princeton. They were all recognized authorities in their own field. He challenged them with questions like, how reliable is the New Testament? Does evidence exist for Jesus outside of the Bible? Is there any reason to believe that the resurrection was actually an event? And you know what? He found after all of his investigations, it was true, verifiable, and he gave his life to Jesus. So, if you really do want to meet with Jesus, I suggest you write a book trying to disprove the resurrection. This is an important thing to consider. The resurrection of Jesus is it true? And if it is true, it is of ultimate significance. C.S. Lewis said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. So if it is true, consider this today. Jesus died for you. Why? Why did he die? Well, because there was a great gap 
The book of Romans, written by the Apostle Paul, in Romans 3.23, says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we can all think we're okay. You know, compared to others, we're not that bad. And we kind of have this moral ladder. You know, Mother Teresa and some other saintly people at the top, and, you know, murderers, Hitler, those kind of guys at the bottom. But God compares us to Jesus, the perfectly holy, righteous one. And we are separated by what the Bible calls sin, the stuff in our life that we have done, and we have all turned our back on Christ. Later on in the book of Romans, it says the wages of sin is death. But, the Bible never leaves us there, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Sin means we are separated from God. Death is our wage, our consequence, meaning being spiritually dead towards God in this life and eternally dead to God in a living hell when we die. And we can't understand the cross. The cross. Why has God forsaken Jesus if we, we don't understand then all of the human race has turned its back on God and stand guilty before him? Deserving judgment and punishment. But we do eventually have to answer for the way that we have lived. This is a very short time that we have on this life. And what comes next goes on and on and on and on forever and ever. But this is why God forsook, forsook Jesus on the cross. Because as in a court of law where there's been a crime committed, there has to be a punishment to be paid... Jesus is like the judge who's convicted but comes round to the person saying, I will take the punishment for you. And eternal life means that God has given us this gift of eternal life for those who choose Jesus. Doesn't matter where you were born, doesn't matter what your parents believe, what family you grew up in, you need to choose Jesus. God is altogether and completely holy, and he hates sin so seriously he cannot have anything to do with it. It cannot be in his presence. But he is not only perfectly holy, he is perfectly merciful. And he hatched the plan, the full sentence of death was carried out, and there was a way of escape for all of mankind. The plan was the great exchange. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. He became what we are, sinners, so that we might become what he is, righteous. He got what we deserve, death, so that we might receive what only he can give, and that is life, and life in all of its fullness. The gospel is this, that we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dare believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. So what does Easter mean to you? Why don't you this Easter discover the true meaning of Easter? God has revealed himself in the person of Jesus that he died for you, that he really did rise from the dead. There is hope beyond this life. There is hope for this life. Right now in an encounter with Jesus. And in him we find life and life in all its fullness. It's a free gift. And it's on offer today. And all you have to do when you're given a gift is accept it. It says in John, the, the Gospel of John, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And there's a simple way we can be begin this relationship, and it's by saying three things. Sorry for the wrong things that I've done. Turning from them. The Bible calls it repentance turning our back on it, thanking him for dying on the cross for our sin. And then please, because God doesn't force his way into our life, 
He wants you to invite him. And these words are a decision to follow Christ. Then follows a life of following Jesus. We mustn't misunderstand these words, by the way. When we do this, this doesn't mean by saying these three simple words and saying a prayer, putting your hand up, doesn't mean you're a Christian and then you carry on with life. It means this is the decision. It's like, I talked about this last week, it's like you make the promises at your wedding and then you spend the rest of your life working those promises out. This is what this is. This is what I'm talking about here. What follows is a life getting to know God, letting him change you from the inside out. He loves you and accepts you as you are, but he wants to conform you into the image of his son. All those years ago, when I started dating my wife, I was not a Christian. And a couple of years later, I gave my life to Christ, and I've spent the next 20 years working out, getting to know God, and becoming more like Christ. That's what it means to be a disciple, a Christian. It's a decision that means you have to die to yourself. It means that you will lose your life, but ultimately you will gain it. So you can start this relationship with God by saying these words. And we're all going to bow our heads, if that's okay. And I'm going to pray And you might want to pray that for the first time. The words are on the screen as well, if it helps you. I feel Jesus is calling people right now into a relationship with him. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. And you can start that relationship right now. You can say these words after me. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong in my life. You might want to take a moment to think and ask for forgiveness. I now turn from everything that I know is wrong. Thank you that you died on the cross for me so that I can be forgiven. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your Holy Spirit. I now receive that gift. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit and be with me forever. Amen. If we could just keep our heads bowed for a moment. You might want to just consider it. If you didn't pray that, maybe God is just speaking to you. And if you did pray that for the first time, just while everyone's got their heads bowed, maybe you could just raise your hand just so I can know. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And Lord, we just want to thank you for this event that has changed our lives forever, that we can know God, we who were far from you can be called children of God. Amen. Amen. 